Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. My name is Laura Hug, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo. And this morning, we're going to be doing Metagenomics 2, which is the module looking at assembly of metagenomic data and generation of metagenome assembled genomes. And I wanted to give a little bit of backdrop of who I am and what kinds of questions I ask. And my research really boils down to thinking about microbial communities from two different angles. I'm interested in who is there, what kind of microbial diversity is present at a site, and then also quite critically, what are they doing? What um, are the roles that these organisms are playing within a community? And we'll come back to this image a bit later in, the, in this presentation. So within this lecture, what I am hoping to, to do is that by the end of this lecture, you'll understand um, the basics of metagenomic assembly, um, what those, what advantages that provides, what disadvantages that provides, how we're able to bin that assembled data into metagenome assembled genomes. I'll be calling those mags from now on in, and then how to take that one step further and analyze those mags to actually derive some conclusions about an ecosystem and how these different populations are actually contributing to biogeochemical cycling or how the, the microbial interactions are taking place. And so you should, at the end, be able to define reads, contigs, and scaffolds and understand how those three things interact together, um, as well as a metagenome assembled uh, genome, and to understand how that scaffolding of information can help us make um, strong uh, conclusions about microbial diversity. And I know that you talked about functional annotation of metagenomes in Dr. Langille's section yesterday. And so I want you at the end of this to appreciate the additional information that you get when you've been metagenomic data and, and a few case studies of, of how that has really changed our understanding of microbial um, function and, and connection. And then I think we'll also learn a little bit about the disadvantages along the way, right? It's not a one size fits all kind of solution. So I think I want you to understand what this process is, what it allows us to do, what it doesn't allow us to do and, and what we can do moving forward. Now, this is our basic roadmap for this whole lecture. Um, we are gonna be starting with a sample, working through how one actually sequences and assembles, how the annotation and binning takes place, and then some of the um, follow on work that can be done there. Um, and so we are gonna start with assembly. And in order, I think up till now, you've been thinking about metagenomes in this workshop as this, you know, you take your sample, it can be any sample, it could be a biofilm from your tongue. I'm sorry, I know it's early in the morning, or it could be a, a sample from a bioreactor, which is the case study we're gonna use in the lab that follows this lecture. And you extract total community DNA, and then you sequence it. And this is, I think, up till now, this is what you've seen in, in yesterday's workshop. And this sequencing can be done in two different ways. There are long read sequencers that we're going to talk about a little bit, but the majority of microbial metagenomic sequencing data right now is still shorter reads, often Illumina sequencing. And so these little fragments are typically 150 to 300 base pairs long. And so our first step here is to think about assembly. And so assembly is the process of generating longer sequence fragments based on read overlaps. And there are some different considerations if you're working with those long reads or if you're working with short reads. Um, I've highlighted a couple of the, the major uh, sequencing technologies, so Illumina or NovaSeq, which is relatively new on the market, but it is the same chemistry as Illumina sequencing, but it's about a third the cost. So it's becoming very popular because you can get a lot more data for a lot less money um, or long reads. And in this, I will talk about how long reads help us with assembly, especially within a community. Um, so I'm highlighting nanopore sequencing, or you might've heard of their Minion, little cartridge sequencer that you can take with you anywhere uh, that they're trying to send to Mars, uh, and PacBio. And these are two very, very different sequencing chemistries and sequencing approaches, but they really lead to very similar end results in terms of the reads and the informatic analysis that you can do with them. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, we're going to focus on those short reads. So the process of assembly is the process of identifying overlaps in sequence within these short reads and allowing that to assemble things. As I go through this, I am going to highlight some tools that people 
typically use. And if they're bolded, then those are the tools that were used. Either you're going to use them in the, um, in the workshop, in the, the lab, or they are what were used to pre-process the data for the lab that you're going to see. So IDBAUD is a very common assembler. Spades three, also very popular. And that was what was used for the data in the workshop. Now, assembly is a process in which we are attempting to move from sequence reads, which are these little short sequences, again, with Illumina data, 150, maybe 300 base pairs. And we are assembling those into context. So immediately we're moving away from the work that you were doing um, yesterday with the short reads being the totality of the information you were working with. In this case, what we're trying to do is identify overlaps based on coverage. So in this scenario, we're building these contigs. Contig stands for a contiguous sequence of DNA. And that means that there are no gaps of information within this sequence, and that there was a somewhat stable amount of coverage that led to us identifying what that sequence was. So here in this example, if you drew a line down this overlap of different reads at any one position, you'd have about four reads that were identifying the information at that spot. So maybe if I draw a line right here, there are three reads that overlap that, and maybe they all say that that specific position is an A. And that allows us to overlap and overlay and create these contigs. Um, and that concept of coverage is something we're going to come back to. So I just wanted to highlight that there. Now, so contigs, contiguous DNA, what does this give us? This gives us a longer stretch of DNA. So instead of having maybe a quarter of a 16S ribosomal RNA gene, or maybe a third of a protein gene, we now might have a whole gene operon or a larger stretch of a microbial genome. I will on an aside say, I understand this is likely a review for some of you. And so you can uh, just follow along, um, but it's an important component of understanding what a, a mag is and what underlies a mag and where our uncertainty is with that. Contigs do not have any missing data. They represent perfect overlaps. Scaffolds are the next step out. And for scaffolding, what we're doing is we're ordering and orienting contigs so that we know that they would face each other in this order, in this direction, in the underlying genome from the population that we sampled from the environment. But we don't have all of the information. There's a gap in our sequencing for whatever reason. This might be stochastic random chance. We just didn't sequence that section. Um, it might be that this is a homopolymer run and there's, you know, it's a difficult area for a sequencer to work through. Um, and the way that we can do that is with read pairs. So the way that we sequence in general with Illumina sequencing and also other short read sequencers is that what will happen is we will take a genomic extraction from a microbial community. So we'll have total genomes um, extracted and we will fraction those up into shorter pieces. And so those are typically 300, 500, maybe a thousand base pairs. They're quite short. And this is how we're building our sequencing library. And so here the gray is a piece of DNA that came from our environmental sample. And so we know that came from a single organism's genome because um, it was a, a physical piece of DNA. And in creating a library for sequencing, we anneal these adapters in orange to the ends of this. When we sequence, we do not know any of the gray sequence whatsoever, but we do know the sequence of the adapters that we've attached. And so we have sequencing primers that will start I will anneal here and then start extending and generate a, a signal of what each individual base is moving forward. And so a paired read means that we have a forward read that represents this end of this piece of, of library construct and a reverse read that has moved from this end using a primer to the adapter here. But what we know is that those two reads, now these are just little fragments of DNA, we're back up into sort of this space, this is our output data. We know that they were physically connected. We know that they are facing each other on this specific piece of DNA within an environment. And that allows us to say, okay, well, we also know based on whatever we shared those fragments to what you know, kind of information, amount of information, amount of sequence was present between these two pairs. So when we're scaffolding, we can use this information. We use it in assembly as well, but it's kind of baked into the algorithms to make sure the reads are oriented correctly and in the right sort of distance from each other. But what we can have is if we have sequence contig A, maybe we're up here, and sequence contig B, and our forward read from this piece of DNA 
is on contact A at the end facing in this direction. And our reverse read is on contact B was incorporated into contact B facing in the other direction. Then we know that there was a physical connection between these two sites and we can order and orient scaffold A and B with this information. Now, ideally, this is not a single read pair that is spanning this gap. Normally, you'd have many different read pairs. And so the distance that we're missing in this space is usually not this full distance of your library. It's often only a few nucleotides where we just haven't quite managed to sequence and overlap to create a contig of this length. And so from our reads, we can generate contigs based on direct overlaps. But from our paired reads, we can then scaffold those contigs together. And here again, if perhaps we had half of an operon, maybe we now have the upstream part of that operon. Maybe we're starting to get into really large chunks of a genome where we can really look at not just the genomic content and genes present and functional you know, potential of that organism or population, but also um, the relationships between those genes and promoters and, and connections there. And so that's what's underlying most major assembly pipelines is a, an original overlapping of the raw sequence data and then a scaffolding component to try and extend those connections. And so you'll have ends here as a statement of uncertainty. And often this is, you know, 10 fewer, maybe two or five ends that re represents the amount of sequence that we don't have covered between these two contigs when we know the distance and size of the insert in our library. Now that's short read sequencing. So long read sequencers are you know, a really different world and they have a lot of exciting potential and they're becoming much more commonly used. Um, they are still largely used for isolate sequencing and I'll explain why. So there are two very different technologies, the PacBio Smart Sequencing and the Oxford Nanopore Sequencing, canonically just discussed in, you know, on Twitter within groups as, as the Minion Sequencing. Um, and both of these, they use totally different chemistries, but they generate really similar raw results, which are these long, multi-thousands of base pair reads that have quite a high error rate. So the error rate of Illumina or NovaSeq is about 0.01, 0.1%, really, really highly accurate. The error rate with long read sequencers is somewhere between eight to 15%. And that's really where these technologies are working to improve. They're working to reduce that error, but it is still quite high. Um, but when I say that these are long reads, we were working, you know, we we're talking about 150 to 300 base pairs before. With minion sequencing from Oxford Nanopore, your only limitation is the length of the DNA molecule that you've managed to extract. So with an incredibly careful and delicate extraction, you can have very, very long DNA fragments and those will sequence in their entirety. And so the current record, there's a trophy that uh, the lab that has the longest minion read has, they get to keep it in their, in their lab while they have hold the trophy. And I believe the current record is 2,272,580 base pairs. And that is longer than a lot of microbial genomes. That is essentially a genome in a single read as raw data, not assembled at all. Now, the problem with this for metagenomic data is really that error rate. Um, and so what happens in long read sequencing when you are assembling long read sequencers, ideally you want quite a lot of coverage. And what will happen is that because these errors are largely random, um, they don't quite have the same problems with homopolymer runs that Illumina data does, then if you have enough coverage of your genome of interest, then you can figure out what the correct answer is by a majority rules vote, right? So if you have random errors popping up quite frequently, but they're random, if you sequence it enough times, you'll be able to get a very clean sequence. And you don't need a ton of coverage, maybe 10x, 20x to get a very clean um, isolate genome out of long read sequencing. It has really revolutionized isolate sequencing. With metagenomes, the problem is, is that you started with a community and you started with different populations. And these populations likely had strain variation. That is biologically true. That is a difference between the different organisms within a population or within the community. And it is very difficult at the moment to understand, to clarify which of these differences when you are aligning long reads actually stem from sequence error and which are biologically accurate. And so where long read sequencers have really been leveraged for metagenomes is in helping with assembly and with that scaffolding step. 
And so the idea here being is if each of these blue and red sections are short reads that have been assembled together, then maybe there's a question or a repeat or something that's preventing the generation of a full scaffold or a contig here. A long read, even if error prone, can tell you how these scaffolds map together and provide a blueprint for assembling those. And so just to put that in a slightly different graphical view, if you have a short read assembly and here these R's are repeats, then what you can see is that there isn't really the ability for one of these short reads to span across this distance. The repeat is too large for the, for the reads to span it. And so if you're mapping out how these different pieces of genomic information fit together, you end up in this perfect loop where it's just as likely that A goes to C as it is that A goes to B. And if you have some long reads, that can deconvolute this assembly graph very cleanly. And so you can see that here is a read that goes exactly through that repeat from A to B and answers, no, the answer is from A to B. And similarly, this read goes from the repeat to C to the repeat. And, oh, sorry, no, we would want this one, from B to the repeat to C. And so you can actually create a very clean linear genome map if you have some long reads to, to map on top. There have been a few studies in the last year, two years that have done just long read sequencing and assembly for microbial communities, but they have only really been successful for really small consortia that are quite simple or, you know, things like um, uh, sulfate reducing bacteria and purple sulfur bacteria, um, you know, consortium interaction, because you need a lot of sequencing to answer the question of, you know, where those errors are. Um, and if you have a relatively complex or even community, it's going to be very difficult to generate enough of that sequencing. So mostly right now, long reads are still used to, to strengthen scaffolding and to, to clarify your assembly. Okay, so that's the quick primer on assembly. In your lab, we have already done the assembly steps. These are computationally intensive. They take a long time. We've run that for you. You'll be starting with um, essentially bins to work with. So we're gonna, but I wanted to highlight what that process looks like and how that changes the data that you're working with. Cause now, you know, you're really working with a, a stretch of genome that is quite long and can be hundreds of thousands of base pairs long. And that gives you a very different analysis pipeline compared to short reads and single and not assembled reads, um, but also allows you to start looking at these as, at a population level. So we're gonna move on to binning. Were there questions at this point? No one has their hand up here. So unless there's something on Slack or Zoom, I think we're okay. I can't see the Slack or Zoom, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on from assembly. Sorry, Laura, John has a question. Okay. Yep. Uh, hi, Laura. Are you there? Uh, I have a question about the um, error rate of that. How much does that do this to overcome the issue of the error rate for so the question was the eight to 15% error rate with like rolling circle based like sequencing that like iterates over and over again. How would that help with this sort of error rate and combat that? Yeah, so with the PacBio sequencing, you have a trade-off with PacBio. So MinION is just a straight read of your DNA fragment. You don't resequence it ever. It goes through and it's done. Um, with PacBio smart sequencing, you are able to set your library size to smaller. And so instead of getting 10,000 base pairs of a single piece of DNA that you're sequencing, you can go around the same piece of maybe three KB three times and then, or five times or something, right? And that will give you a majority rules, accurate read. And that is really helpful. What you are sacrificing is length, right? So if the ultimate sequence information around that construct, the, the PacBio constructs are kind of barbells, they open up to around and they sequence around them. Um, what you sacrifice is length in favor of quality. And so if I'm trying to scaffold 200 genomes, I may, it may be more useful for me to have 50,000 10 KB pieces than 50,000 3 KB pieces that are accurate. Um, if I'm trying to sequence a complicated or complex microbial community, 
neither of those is going to give me enough depth to really assemble anything except possibly the most abundant organism, assuming there is one that's kind of dominating the system. And so you can absolutely get fairly long reads about, I think about three to five KB, um, which is still hugely longer than a short read. Um, you can get that at pretty high accuracy, but at a cost of sequencing depth, you're going to get less information from that community at higher accuracy. Great. Also, uh, Will informed me he has his iPad set up so you can see the class roughly. Yeah, um, I can see the class. <laughs> yeah, you can see all your students. If you can, you can check there for questions. And uh, yeah, some of them are waving. And if there's someone outside your field of view, I'll just let you know. Okay, perfect. But right now you're good. Yeah. Yeah, I can see you. So if you like wave aggressively, I'll notice you and I can, I can check for a question. Um, Okay, so we're going to move forward. We've done our assembly. We're now working with these longer fragments. Some of them may be really long. Some of them may not be that long. Um, we typically then size select to 200, 2,500 base pairs long as sort of an informative, useful chunk and dismiss anything that's smaller. So that's that's our personal preference. Some people work with 1,000 and up. Um, below that, you start to get a lot of stochastic error in how the binning happens. And I'll talk about why that would be. Okay, so we're going to come back to annotation. Sometimes you annotate and binners can use that information. Most binners now, most algorithms will bin the fragments in the absence of, of some annotation or they'll do an in, internal annotation. So binning, what is binning? Binning is the process of associating DNA fragments from a metagenomic assembly together based on shared characteristics. And what we're trying to generate here are, are not sort of isolate clonal genomes, but a population level draft genome. And we call these metagenome assembled genomes to denote that they did come from a mixed community. We didn't have that organism growing in culture. It's coming from an informatic pipeline rather than a like direct biological sample. And there are a number of different characteristics of these assembled data that we are able to use to create these bins. So we're gonna go over the most commonly used. They're mostly all used in combination actually. So in this example, we're gonna be walking through this set of blue scaffolds. So these are our scaffolds and we would like to use the information embedded in these scaffolds and inherent in our data to identify which of these putatively came from the same original population to identify which pieces of these we could scaffold together to make a genome. And the main four main ways that we do this are through use of nucleotide composition, phylogenetic affiliation of genes. This one's not as common. Read depth or coverage and coverage patterns. So nucleotide composition is like a fingerprint of the DNA. And it works under the assumption, and it's empirically true, that the variation of nucleotide frequency across a sequence and across different sequences within the same genome is lower. That variation is lower than the signature from a different population. And so you can look at shared patterns of, of nucleotide frequency and associate scaffolds together based on that signature. Now, this is biologically driven, right? Most organisms have a codon frequency that they prefer to use. They have specific tRNAs that they use. And because microbial genomes are very efficient, they don't have a lot of junk DNA, then those codon frequency preferences really start to embed as a specific signature that you can see within a, a genome. We typically use slightly more information than just a triplet codon. We typically use either a former, five mer, or six mer. Um, in this case, the example is a former. And the way that you build up that um, that fingerprint is you just take a sliding window of four nucleotides. This is ACGG. The next former is CGGC, GGCT, et cetera. And you would do that for every scaffold in your data set. And you would define that scaffold's frequency table of which oligonucleotides were identified. And then you would compare those in sort of an n-dimensional space to cluster scaffolds that share similar patterns. And so one of the reasons that we choose to work with 2,500 base pair scaffolds and higher is because if you are working with a former or a six mer, you need some level of information there. If you're using 300 base pairs or 500 base pairs, you're gonna get a lot of random signal. It's gonna be very difficult to bin. Okay, the other uh, option is to look at phylogenetic affiliation of scaffolds. This can be very powerful in the right community, but it is typically used as more of a back check for curation to just make sure something hasn't ended up in the wrong spot. And an example of how this works is if you have a specific scaffold, then what you can do is look at each individual gene that was identified on that scaffold using a gene collar and annotation. Again, we'll get to that later because it often comes later and identify you know, who that gene most closely affiliates with. 
And for instance, if we have scaffold number one, this is a very strong delta proteobacterial signature and even actually a fairly strong signal for this to be coming from a geobacter population or something within that same family. Um, and you would expect because this family is relatively well characterized that other scaffolds from this genome would have a similar signature. If you compare this to scaffold two, which has you know one with absolutely no hit, no close re relationships in the, the NCBI protein database, and then three different phyla represented, this sort of scrambled signal is what we often see in a scaffold of an organism that is not well represented in the reference database. And so this might be a novel phylum, a novel class within one of these groups. And that signature can also, like, even though it's a scramble, can also be quite consistent. So we, at one point in my postdoc, we were binning something that we were calling the chlorofermes because they weren't either a chloroflexi or a firmicute, but all of their genes kind of randomly associated to one of those two groups. It turned out that they were actually quite closely related to the chloroflexi, but a separate lineage. And so you can look at these and bin solely based on this. There's database biases associated with that. And there are um, definitely concerns around, you know, if something has been inserted or laterally transferred, it may not look like the rest of the genome yet. Um, and so uh, again, this is often, if you had a whole bin that had this signature, and then there was one shorter scaffold that looks like this, that scaffold would be suspect. You might manually curate it away. So coverage and coming back to that concept of depth of coverage is a really important component for binning. And so uh, we use coverage as a proxy for abundance. Because if you remember, we've extracted whole DNA from a microbial community. That DNA will be present at you know, the rough abundance of the different populations that were present. When very abundant, more of its DNA will be present. And the sequencing does not really have an amplification step that introduces bias. So you can still think of that as a proxy for the abundance of that organism in the environment. And so in this example, again, if we're looking at this, this is a coverage of about 4x. And it will, because um, anywhere that I draw down, like if this was a T or a G, there's about four reads that are supporting that information. So that is what is meant as a depth of coverage. In a single sample, you might be able to pull out your most abundant population or you know several lower abundant populations that all had a really shared but specific um, signal. So all of their scaffolds have the same um, coverage. But where coverage as a binning component comes into its own is if you have serial samples, which is also becoming the standard. It wasn't originally, metagenomes were too expensive, but it is much more standard now. And what I mean from this is this. So here we have sequential samples. Maybe this is a, a drug dose survey of clinical patients. Maybe this is a soil core and you're going down by depth. Maybe this is a temporal sampling where you've come back to the same field site you know, every month for a year. Um, so these are our samples and the population abundance of an organism will be changing over time in response to whatever variables are impacting it. And you can see that reflected in its relative proportion of coverage within a data set. And so what you're looking at here are two different scaffolds and they really follow the same kind of track through these different samples. So um, this scaffold was not very abundant and then it sort of grows in abundance and really precipitously drops off in sample G, whatever that is. Now these share a pretty common pattern, but I want you to notice is what happens if you start adding additional scaffolds, maybe don't come from the same population. And here you see, this is scaffold three and it's fairly abundant and then it has a steady downward trend throughout the series. And if we only had sample D, it would be very difficult based on coverage alone to separate these two scaffolds from each other, or even maybe these three. But when we have the full series, you can see that it's very easy to identify and mathematically straightforward to identify that this scaffold has a very different pattern of abundance than these scaffolds. You add a fourth one in and it's a similar you know, scenario. If we only had sample C, then these two might be very difficult to tell apart in terms of where like these scaffolds might cluster together based on coverage alone. But this organism or population, relatively abundant, has a spike and then is virtually absent from the rest of the series. That's a very specific pattern. And that can be used to cluster scaffolds that share that same pattern through time or across space or within a patient. Now, I just wanna clarify how this works. So these, let's say these are all four scaffolds from assembly A. So we have our raw reads from assembly A, we've generated scaffolds, we know the coverage. What we've done is we've taken the reads from sample B and mapped them onto the scaffolds of A to see how that population from A specifically moved throughout time or space or whatever we're looking at. And so we took the reads from C and mapped them to metagenome A. 
assembly, took the reads from D, mapped them to the assembly from A. And you can do this as an all versus all. So we would also take, you know, we would bin D, the assembly of D, by mapping each of the other reads to that assembly. Now, most modern binning pipelines use a combination of these tools. So they will frequently use both tetranucleotide frequency and depth of coverage or serial coverage if it's available in order to create a, a sort of n-dimensional space clustering of these scaffolds, identify limits around them to sort of draw a line around a group and say, okay, these all cluster tightly enough together that I think they represent a single population. Um, and then when we take that back to our original set of scaffolds, we now have three different bins that have been identified. And we can work with these bins and move them down into you know, identifying genes, looking at the met metabolism, looking at their abundance over time in response to different variables to maybe better understand their niche and role within an environment. There's a number of different binning tools available. Um, we, in this in the tutorial used a combination of MaxBin2, Metabat, and Concoct. They each use a combination of binning algorithms, of, of binning information. So they each use nucleotide frequency as well as serial coverage if it's available. Um, and I also wanted to just highlight NVO here, which is another option for binning. It runs Concoct under its hood, so it's, it's not actually that different an algorithm, but it's a really strong visual interface. If you don't have access to really strong computational clusters um, or are less confident in the command line, working in a visual system can be great, and NVO is really strong for that. So I just wanted to highlight it as a, a really useful tool. So I said we use these three binners in order to create the bins for the tutorial. And that should leave us with three slightly different answers. They're all using similar information, but they all have different decision points and thresholds. They're using it in slightly different ways. And so what we did was we then used a tool called Das Tool, which in German is the tool, uh, which is a way of taking input from different binners. So now we've created bins three different ways from the same data. So it's the same underlying scaffolds. And we've put them together into DOS tool and said, what's the best answer? Which of these gives us the cleanest number of highest quality bins? Um, and so in general, how DOS tool works is it will take assemblies from maybe this is max bin two, this is metabat, this is concoct. These are the same scaffolds in each case, right? It will identify single copy genes. These are expected to be present in most or all microbial genomes and expected to only be present once. So they're a really nice way of seeing, you know, do I have a whole genome? Do I have more than a whole genome? Am I missing pieces? So the single copy marker sets are a really important part of assessing quality of a bin. And we'll see that again in the tool that we use for quality. And so what DOS tool is, it says, okay, well, I have these bins from bin uh, from input one, from bin set one, and these and these, and this is what their quality looks like. Some of these are great. These are a quality of 1.0. That's perfect. Some of them are, you know, there's a little bit of overlap. We see this star and diamond single copy uh, genes twice. Um, again, over here, some are missing, some are duplicated. They get a score as to how clean they are to start. And then what DOS tool does is it says, okay, well, but these are the same scaffolds from this bin and from that bin, from the two different binners, that was the same information. So how with this, can I generate the cleanest possible bins that have the highest quality? And it will make decisions based on, you know, which of these bins is the cleanest. In this case, this bin and this bin shared all information except for this one scaffold, which actually introduces a duplication of this triangle marker gene. And so in this case, DOS tool decides I'm gonna keep the clean, uh, the clean bin from bin set two. I think that was a better decision made by that um, binning algorithm. And so at the end of the day, you've, you know, you've generated your coverage tables, you've figured out your nucleotide frequencies, you've run your various binners, you've combined them, you've generated a final curated set of bins. And what you have at the end of the day are these FASTA files. And here they're unzipped and also unzipped. Um, and this is just a FASTA file of a scaffold. It's just raw DNA information. They're long pieces. And you have one for each of your bins. So moving from this, what we really need is quality information, taxonomic placements, who are these? How good a quality are these, these bins? What do they encode? What does that tell us about their you know, capacity for function in an environment? And then what does that mean in terms of our environment in question? So that's the binning section. I'm just going to pause and see if there are any questions before we move on to actually analyzing these bins. <laughs> 
Um, so the question was, is there a problem of overbinning or underbinning? There can be. So you, you get things that are called megabins, and that would be a bin that had, you know, really the same tetranucleotide frequency, really tight um, coverage data, and it's all been binned together. That all makes sense. But when you look at it, there's, you know, five copies of every single single copy marker gene. And so like that's underbinned, right? You could probably take that bin alone and try to tease it apart. Maybe that's where you pull in the phylogenetic information to see if these aren't all the same strain, like different strains of the same genome behaving differently, or are they, you know, one's a chloroflexi and one's a firmicute and you quite cleanly separate them. Um, often those just end up discarded back into the unbinned group um, if, if they're gonna be messy to curate. And then overbind is hard to separate from partially sampled. So with a metagenome and a complex community, you are going to get more information from the most abundant organisms. Other organisms may partially assemble and they may be 20, 30% complete. And there might be you know, 20% of this genome and 30% of this genome, and they don't overlap on their marker genes. So theoretically putting them together would make a 50% complete genome. But if they didn't share tetranucleotide frequencies or they weren't binned based on coverage, like these are probably actually just partial pieces, you have a little bit of information about this organism that wasn't abundant enough to be sequenced deeply enough to assemble well enough to bin. And so again, like teasing apart whether or not that's biologically accurate information or just an algorithmic error is a little tricky. And so what we tend to do is, again, that just goes into the sort of unbinned, we're not working with that data information. So in, um, in my lab, we have like a quality and a completion threshold. That's the next thing we're going to talk about as to which of these bins we then move forward with. And the rest go back to a, this is assembled. We still have big pieces of DNA, but we're treating it as a like, here's the total community. Here's, here's all the other organisms that we sampled a bit of that we don't have a clean enough genome to treat individually. And so we'll work with that unbin data and then the bins sort of as separate pieces. Yeah, Diana. So Diana's question was, how, how often is DOS tool used? Is it computationally expensive to run separate binning algorithms and then put all that input into DOS tool? I feel like Nikhil can answer that question better than I, because he's the one who set up this pipeline for our lab, and it was very painful. Um, it takes more time. None of the binners, like none of the binners take as long as the assembly does. So you're into sort of a, you are gaining, if you're gaining information and gaining quality, you've already got a sunk cost of a ton of time to make the assemblies and make the read maps. Once you have the read map information, which all of them use, running additional like binners is not, it definitely adds time, but each of them is sort of equivalently um, computationally intensive. So none of them are making it harder. And DOS tool is actually less computationally intensive than, than the, the binners themselves and runs faster. So it's a cleanup step at the end. You could choose your binner of choice. Lots of people do. It's it's usually it's usually Metabat, right? Yeah. Yeah, Automatic. Metabat is usually mm -hmm. the better yeah. on, on balance. Um, but you do improve, you do get improved information from running multiple ones and then DOS tools. So if you already have the computational like infrastructure to do the assemblies and the read mapping, you're going to be able to run the binners. It's whether or not you want to do it. You know, if you have hundreds of samples, it's going to extend your time. Yeah. And just to add on it, as she mentioned, like DOS tool runs super fast. Um, since I like developed the workflow, like every paper I read now, they use multiple binners. And a lot of them are using DOS tool, like the same three we're using. But as she said, Metabat 2 and Maxbin 2 are usually some of the common ones used. Uh, yeah. Did you have any questions? Now? Yeah, sorry. So the question was, if you do the binning on serial samples, is there any, is there any chance you miss longitudinal information? Okay, so the question is like, how would the scaffolds abundance like changing, like if you're going and doing these serial samples, um, how would the scaffolds abundance changing due to other factors impact this process? Is that kind of what your question was? 
Oh, okay. I see what you mean. So I think the question is like you have the same bin in multiple samples. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. It was different like. abundances. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's different philosophies of like you can assemble all your samples together and just bin a giant metagenomic assembly and then um and map all your reads to that. And the problem there is that you're often increasing the amount of strain variation um between your individual data sets and so especially in things like soil i don't i don't really recommend it unless you have to do it um in order to have enough sequence steps but uh so there's also a tool called drep that will take so say i've made all my bins from um let's go back to this let's make i've made all my bins from sample a i've made all my bins from sample b i've made all my bins from sample c and like yeah probably this organism whatever this scaffold whoever organism this scaffold belongs to is probably going to be present as a bin in both a and b and then not really in c d e f or g and there is a tool called drep that will take bins and say these are the same bins and this is the best quality one so work with this forward so you can have a dereplicated set and just say okay well then this bin and maybe it was the one from b because the higher abundance probably a higher quality genome um is now the population that we're going to track across this data set in this way there are advantages to doing that you're dealing with many fewer bins right maybe you had a hundred per sample and now you instead of having 800 bins to work with you have about probably 200 because they won't all be present in each um so that simplifies things but if you're really interested in fine scale changes like some of Nikhil's work looks at CRISPR Cas systems and the the CRISPR arrays and those are going to change over time specifically or, or across populations and if you choose one best bin that different array would not be enough sequence information for the algorithm to say no oh, this is a different genome it would say okay these are the same use this one it's the best quality if they had differences like even one space or change or things like that you'd lose it so depending on what your question is Amalgamating your sequence data pre-assembly almost never makes sense, but amalgamating your assemblies and your, your bins after can really streamline your workflow. And, and we, we do do that for certain questions and we don't, or we'll go back to the undereplicated bins to look at a different question. So it's kind of a mix. Does that That's make sense? Question? Cool. Hannah, do you have any question? So the question was, do you have any comments on a comparison between MetaWrap and DOS tool? That was the question, right? I, okay. Oh, no, I've heard of MetaWrap, but I haven't tried it. So I haven't done an empirical test of the number of bins and the quality of bins that it generates. My understanding is that they're working from a pretty similar perspective. Um, what would be interesting, and I don't, I, I'm not very familiar with MetaWrap, would be interesting is if it was actually trying to like rebin, whereas DOS tool is really choosing like this is the best of the three that have these scaffolds. So work with this one versus, oh, the like actual best option for these, if we think of them as like an ORT cloud of a genome, is this, which wasn't really captured by any of the three, but is the best answer coming out of the three as a amalgamated set. And that would be interesting. Um, and it might do that. I don't know. I don't actually not very familiar with it. I have heard of it. Okay. Yeah. So she was just confirming, like they do the same thing, taking output from the different algorithms. They, I think, in some analysis, so they pick they, the best one. Kind of yeah. Thing. It, yeah. I mean, it might be better so far, like than Dust Tool and so on. But yeah, I haven't read into MetaRap. I'll do it in downtime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we, we started a bit late. So I think we go like 10 after on this, right? You end at 10. I can. Yeah. Late. I have one more section. I can try and catch us up a little, but because um, yeah. a lot of it is tools you're going to immediately see now in the in the tutorial. Um, okay. Cool. So I don't, we'll I don't just, need to do it too much, but okay. So I guess we could just proceed with the lecture. Okay, cool. Yeah, everyone's good. good. Yeah. Okay. So we're moving on now. We have our mags. We've assembled our data. We've binned it however we chose to bin it with whatever information we had. And now we have our mags. And this is a computationally intensive process, right? You saw yesterday, like it's pretty easy to take your reads and just get a sense of who's there and what the functions are. And like, this is not bad. So the advantage of having the mags is that you can then start to look at an individual organism's 
contribution to the system. So you can place them much more robustly taxonomically and identify novel things that are not really in the databases and aren't going to map or annotate well in the databases. Um, you can look at the combination of different capacities that each of these populations has. You can actually generate even sometimes closed genomes for these. If it, you know, if it was already in pretty good shape, you can do a little bit of informatic processing to get a closed genome. And then you're really confident that you're looking at, you know, what this organism has. Um, there are some organisms that are more enigmatic, and this becomes a, a sort of open question when you're analyzing these. This is a disadvantage that I will be honest about, is that if your genome is partial, it is sometimes difficult to know if a pathway is absent or if it just wasn't sampled. In cases where, you know, 12 enzymes are all canonically absent from a 92% complete genome, it probably doesn't have that cycle, right? But if one piece of a 12 uh, enzyme pathway is missing and it's an 80% complete genome, you know, there's some awkward math that happens about whether or not you think that actually is present and not sampled or if it was. But really what this allows us to do is look at these different populations and their then like their connections. Okay, so we're gonna talk about quality of the mag, who the mag is, and how you actually look at what they're capable of doing and what that means for your environment. So quality information. The standard tool right now is CheckM. Um, it is a software package out of Phil Hugenholtz's lab in Australia. And the way that it scores things is again with these single copy genes. So we're coming back to that as our benchmark for how well we have sampled this genome. And the way that it scores things is it expects to see some suite of single copy genes. I think this is the bacterial suite. This is the archaeal suite. So there's fewer genes in the archaea that are conserved. Um, and it is expecting something to be present. If it is absent, there's a penalization. And if there are multiple copies of it, when we really only expect to see one, then it is scored with contamination. So maybe this is a two copy. These are a three copy. We're not going to get into the heterogeneity too much, but that is a, a score of you know, the strain variation within the, the sample. Um, and so the, these are all pretty high quality bins. Um, if we look at their data a little bit more deeply, you know, this was bin one was classified to the bacteria, but no deeper. Um, and it was 99.17% complete and it had no contamination. So it was missing a couple marker genes out of a relatively big set, uh, but it didn't have any duplications. And if you contrast that with bin three, which is up at the top here, again, bacterial 95% complete, but 13% contamination. Now in my lab, typically we draw a limit at about 70% complete. That's enough of a genome to get a sense of what that organism is doing within a community. And then contamination, we either cut it off at about five or 10%. Um, and at that point, it just gets too difficult to say, well, we found this really interesting pathway or this really interesting gene that we've never seen in this group before, but it, it might just be contamination. <laughs> so um, there's ways to look into that more deeply, but in general, we start with a set that are relatively good quality. So just to recap, these colors mean that there's multiple copies when there shouldn't be. Uh, gray means that they're absent and green means they're good. So I'm going to give you a second to look at these and just in your head, decide which one's the worst bin. Okay, now I'm guessing that you have either selected bin 23 or bins 38 or 21 as, you know, pretty messy, right? And in reality, probably none of these three would make it into a final analysis set. Their scaffolds will go back into that unbinned pool of, of you know, good information about the community, but not really at a, at a mag level. Um, and then in terms of what one is actually worst, it's really a question of what your question is. So if I am very interested in what specific community members are contributing to an environment, then bin 23, it's pretty incomplete. It's probably like 20% complete, but it's pretty clean. And in that scenario, if I see something associated with this bin, I'm confident it belongs to that bin. With these guys, there's a lot of header, uh, there's a lot of contamination. And, and that tells me that I can't really trust that this came from a specific organism. And so from my perspective, from most of the questions I ask, like these would be worse to deal with than this one. But in reality, none of these three would really make it through. Okay, so that's our quality scale. We create some quality. We've whittled down our bins to the ones that we think are robust. We can work with them. Now the question is, who is this mag? And maybe the real question is, why do we care who this mag is? Um, and I think you know, understanding the taxonomic placement of an organism 
really gives you a strong evolutionary context. We know a lot about that group. There are specific traits that tend to follow with those groups. We can start with an assumption of what the capacity of this organism is. Um, and it allows us to identify organisms where we don't we're not able to answer who is this Meg. Um, you know, it doesn't really associate to a known phylum or a known class. It might be a novel genera within a well-defined group. Um, and that, from my perspective, is kind of interesting. Um, and so I care who they are. Um, but actually identifying microbes is a thorny problem and it has only gotten worse in the last couple of years um, because there are now two competing taxonomic structures that individuals are using. Um, and I will say for my perspective, my lab uses the genome taxonomy database, which is called the GTDB and their toolkit. Um, this is a toolkit, that I'll come back to this, but this was a toolkit that was built specifically to rectify some of the errors in taxonomy that had built up over time. If you, you know, everyone adds a new branch, Later in life, it turns out those two branches were maybe the same, or you know, these ones are more closely related than others and need to be reassigned and redefined. And it had gotten extremely messy. And the taxonomic system is meant to be a consistent structure that unifies the language that we use to describe microorganisms. Um, the GTTB, like there are a wealth of tools available that use the NCBI taxonomic system, um, but we are going to work within the GTDB system. And again, this was a system that was set up to try and create a unified classification distance on a tree so that your phyla are all, they all encompass approximately the same amount of evolutionary diversity and similar for class, for family, for genus, et cetera. Um, and it did mean a massive redefinition of a lot of different uh, groups, including, you know, changing names, breaking known groups into multiple groups, amalgamating well-known groups into other groups. And that has led to this phenomenon, you may have seen it in the literature, where people will say, oh, I'm working with the Cloassi monodota, previously Cloassi monides, previously WWD3, like, as these names change, we lose that connection to the, the past literature, and that's problematic. But it's also problematic to be talking about organisms that share the same name that are not at all evolutionarily related in the way that those names would suggest. And so I think making a change was necessary. It was a, a big kind of contentious change. Um, and I will just say that this is not the toolkit that everyone uses. So we are going to use GTDB-TK to identify our bins um, in the tutorial. I think that's pre-computed actually, because um, it takes a while. And so in this scenario, it places your genome bin based on single copy marker genes into a tree of all the existing taxonomically classified reference sequences and identifies where it should fall. So in this scenario, for instance, uh, our query sequence is falling in the Staphylococcus uh, genus nested, you know, strongly within that genus. So that, but that's probably a new species in terms of where it's falling. It's not specifically associated with Staphylococcus aureus or hominis. Over here on the flip side, we have a query genome that's falling outside of any of the known um, phyla and might represent a phylum level lineage. And so GTDBTK will try to place this based on its structure of distance, and then will provide a taxonomic breakdown as deep as it can go. So in this case, it would stop at probably bacteria. It would say, this is a bacterium. I can't go any further. Uh, it doesn't fall into a known phylum. And in this case, you would get all the way down to genus in terms of what it was able to classify as. So that's taxonomic placement. You'll see the difference that that information can make in the way that you analyze a community in the tutorial, because you'll work, you'll see the bins on their own and then the bins with taxonomy applied and, and how that allows you to ask a different question. Okay, so gene annotation. This can be a separate step where you just call genes, you're looking for starts and stops and open reading frames. Or, um, and then you annotate that to, you know, to a, a known database and figure out what is this gene, what's it most closely related to, and how closely related is it. Um, and uh, there are some really common tools that are used for this. Often this is kind of wrapped in to a larger pipeline. So the calling of genes is going to happen within a pipeline that is a set program that you're using. And that's true of the, the system that we're working with. Um, but Prodigal, GeneMark, and Glimmer are the most frequently used. Um, the program we're using has Prodigal under the hood, so it will have called the genes, found the stops and starts using Prodigal. 
Then when we annotate the genes, what we're doing is taking this open reading frame, translating it into a protein sequence and saying, what is this protein most closely related to out of everything we've ever seen before? And how closely related is it? Can I confidently say, this is a pyruvate kinase? Can I confidently say, you know, this is involved in glycolysis? Or does it look like a hypothetical protein we've never seen before? Or does it look like a hypothetical protein that we see all the time? We just have no idea what it is. And those all have sort of different levels of confidence. Um, so PROCA and RAST are both really common tools for this. We're going to focus on DRAM, um, which was specifically designed to facilitate comparative metabolic analysis. So being able to look across SMAGs and identify what they're capable of doing. So DRAM is, um, stands for Distilled and Refined Annotation of Metabolism. Um, it, annotates using a suite of different databases, um, including KEG and UNIREF. Uh, this is a carbohydrate um, active group, uh, a viral database, et cetera. Um, and then you can have a custom user database if there's a function of interest that you want to specifically look for. And again, it uses Prodigal. So just to back up a bit. So after binning, we had these FASTA files. These were scaffolds, right? This is our input into DRAM. So we take those FASTA files, put them through DRAM. And what DRAM is going to do is it's going to call genes and then try to annotate those by mapping these genes to all these different databases, all the information we have about microbial metabolism. Um, it's also identifying tRNAs, 16S genes, et cetera. If you want to look for viral scaffolds within your data set, you can run DRAM, but it's a different, like it's DRAM V. It's a slightly side program. And so this will also, you can put in your GTDB taxonomy output and your check M quality output, and it will um, create the sort of full view of these organisms with an annotation table. It gives you three different levels of information. So in the raw data is that it gives you actually the genes it called. It said, okay, this is gene one and gene two and gene three for this bin, for this mag. Um, and that's really helpful if it's predicting something and you want to go back and put that gene on a tree to prove that it really does belong uh, to that function, um, that you have that raw data. Uh, I think they've, they've changed the terminology with the published paper, but the distillate is where you get a tab separated table of this. Okay. So we had gene one and that was its sequence. Now we have gene one is a pyruvate kinase and that raw data is really valuable. And you're going to work through some of the raw data coming out of DRAM to see what kinds of things you can look for and the, the way that it's formatted and how easy that is to use. And the, you know, it's only sort of easy to use. You'd have to really know a lot about metabolism to interpret that, that distillate data. And then um, the distilling step also generates a HTML file that is based on key functional genes. And just a snapshot of part of what that looks like is here, where you have different genomes and it is a heat map of different pathways within it. So it's starting to summarize the uh, metabolism of these groups. And so just if you're looking at this really quickly, if we find cytochrome C oxidase, which is here, there's three different kinds. Um, you can see that some of these organisms are really lacking a cytochrome C oxidase, it starts here and goes three. That's a canonical marker for aerobic re respiration. So organisms that completely lack this are likely anaerobic. And so already just looking at this, you're starting to understand a little bit about the ecology of these organisms. It also looks for specific larger scale geochemical pathways. Are they photosynthetic? Are they able to reduce or oxidize sulfur or nitrogen? Are they involved in methane or simple carbon cycling? And so it's a really powerful tool. It's a, an excellent tool for generating a bunch of these overviews, but unlike some of the other tools, also gives you that raw data to go back to, to say, okay, you think that organism is phototrophic, but I took this from a mine tailing site. I am not expecting to see phototrophic organisms at any real abundance here. I'm going to go in and look at those proteins and figure out if that actually is what's going on. Cause maybe it's really interesting. So this, this, I will keep this last bit brief. Cause you're going to be mostly doing this in the tutorial is the, the idea of taking these mags and really understanding their ecological context. What are they doing? Um, and this image is, is from work I did in my PhD, but this is a culture of organisms that is dominated by the dehelicoides because they are able to uh, reductively dechlorinate these chlorinated solvents. But they are not great at living on their own. They really require these other organisms for three main functions. They need coronoid or vitamin B12 cofactors uh, for the dehelicoides to be able to make the enzymes that generate the only form of energy it can generate, 
um, but they can't make that cofactor themselves. Uh, they need these organisms supporting them for oxygen scavenging and for you know generation of carbon from whatever carbon substrate was added to that culture or in that environment. And so when we have individual bins, we are able to look at these interconnections and, and piece together this network. And so how do we do that? How do we go from a tab separated file or a heat map of how these organisms exist to you know, a full understanding of a microbial metabolism or an understanding of a specific pathway within a, an environment or all the pathways within an environment um, and how these different organisms and what proportion of them are present. And you know, quite unfortunately, the answer is still largely that it's it's just work. It's a lot of work to to pull that out. It isn't easy to to generalize or summarize. Um, and so there are good tools to help you visualize this kind of work. You can look at keg maps of different formats. You can put in proteins that'll light up the pieces of pathways that are present in a given in a given bin, kind of akin to um, the the DRAM output, but in greater detail. You can blast specific genomes uh, and look at you know, their, their protein structure of specific genes in order to understand whether or not this really is that function, it has the right fold or it has the right active groups. Um, but it's a lot of work to take that next step to say, this is really how this all pieces together. This is how we think that this community is functioning. But it's probably worth it. I think it's worth it, obviously, <laughs> that's what my lab does. Um, things that we've learned from this is you know, entirely new radiations on the tree of life that we would not have been able to identify with uh, 16S uh, gene sequencing because um, they don't match the primers or from single read, like unassembled read annotation because they wouldn't map to anything in the database. But when you generate a genome for something, it's, it's a real thing. And so, you know, identifying these larger scale radiations, this is really out of date now, there's a bunch more. So this is something that this tool has really unlocked is an understanding of microbial diversity in an environment. And then also I think like the, the, the like gold star standard for what we can learn with metagenome assembled genomes was the identification of the comamox organisms who nitrification is canonically a two-step process with ammonia oxidizers of the nitrosomonas and nitrite oxidizers of the nitrospira and other groups um, containing separate enzymes. And this is a very clear and, you know, a uh, well-defined handoff in, in biology, but with metagenome assembled genomes from these drip systems, these really slow flow systems, a couple of two different groups at the same time came up with the identification of these comamox organisms, which are nitrospira that have the capacity for ammonia oxidizing. And that really, really changed our understanding of the, the potential energy within the nitrogen cycle and to, to rethink a whole geochemical cycle is pretty exciting. Um, I highlighted a bunch of tools in the, uh, in the tutorial, you're going to work with work from DRAM, uh, work from FE Genie, um, some other systems in there, and we will process the data through some of these tools as well. Um, and so I'm gonna stop there.